Hey, everybody. This is Mike Westerdahl here from criticalbench.com, and I'm pumped right now. I've got Rusty Moore on the line right now to do a special interview with us. If you haven't heard of Rusty, he's the owner of a really high-traffic blog. It's called Fitness Black Book. Now, this blog challenges the typical bodybuilding approach to building a muscular physique, and it's become one of the go-to sites for guys and girls that are looking for that Hollywood look. I thought this was a perfect guy to talk to right now because, as you know, Vince Gironda was the trainer of the stars, and he was the guy that got people ready for the movies back in the day. So this is kind of like the, uh, the new version of that. So I'm really excited to have, uh, have Rusty on the line. Now, Rusty is really opinionated, too. I wouldn't say he's as opinionated as Vince. His blog has been around since 2007. Like I said, it's one of the higher traffic blogs on the, on the Internet. That's pretty good for, you know, he's running this on his own. It's a one-man show. And um, his product is called Visual Impact, and uh, it's all about getting that Hollywood look, like I mentioned. Does that sound about right, Rusty? Yeah, Mike, yeah, that definitely sounds about right. Uh, you know, I, comparing me to Vince or whatever like that, I'm, I'm nowhere in that league. That guy's a, le- a legend. But, uh, you know, as far as fitness blogs go and stuff, yeah, I definitely, uh, you know, I, I hit a nerve, I think, with people. You know, I started a site that was uh, – targeted just to one specific thing. You know, I didn't want to be all things to all people. Those sites were kind of out there a little bit. So my goal was to, to start a site that was just laser targeted just at like the lean Hollywood look because that's, you know, that's my specialty. Um, my girl, girlfriend's a, you know, high-end fashion designer and I go to fashion shows and stuff. And, and I meet a lot of men and women, who, you know, they want to be fit but they don't necessarily want to be um, to add a bunch of size to their body so they can still still wear nice clothes and, you know, and that type of thing. Um, and, and I figured that there's a lot of other people out there in the world besides just the circle of people I run with um, that, you know, you know, want to be fit without looking like a bodybuilder. And at the time, in 2007, um, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of sites. You know, I mean, almost every site was more of a bodybuilding type of site where they had people that, you know, they would be posing and stuff like that. So um, I wanted to start sort of an anti, not against bodybuilding type of blog, but one that just didn't really have any of that. We don't talk about poses. I have no idea who Mr. Olympia is, um, for, you know, for the past 10 years or anything like that. Um, the look I'm aiming for is for, you know, more like men and women, like you'd see like in a James Bond flick. Right. And, uh, you know, that type of thing. And, and again, I'm totally not against the bodybuilder thing. I was just trying to Still avoid and talk talk about what I knew. What I knew, you know, I would get, I would do terrible in the bodybuilding competition, right? So, uh, you know, it'd be dumb for me to talk about that. Uh, well, well, I know, think that that's the way to go. I mean, the guys guys that have websites that are laser targeted like that, focusing in on one thing, you're able to, you know, really help people that are interested in that versus people that try to be everything to everybody. It winds up just not being that great of information. I mean, take guys like Adam Steer and, and Ryan Murdoch. I mean, they are like experts on body weight training. They've got some great stuff out there. You look at like Vince Tomani, he's helping skinny guys. You know, um, Elliot and I with our, our lean hybrid muscle stuff, we're trying to help people get stronger without adding without adding any fat like a lot of people do when they try to get strong. So it's all about getting focused, like you said. Yeah, and, you know, and and I actually even like you know there's some crossover there and stuff too. You know, I, yeah, I've I've used um, you know like Adam and Ryan's uh, Shapeshifter product before. Um, I've learned some stuff from Vince Del Monte. I I read you and Elliot like crazy, and then you know learn some things about you know getting a stronger bench and you know if I can point that sort of thing. So I I don't think that I just think that that people can kind of use a shopping cart approach and pick you know little bits here and there from from people. That, you know that they can learn from, and uh, you know, and and it, and it makes sense to, like yes, like I said, it just makes sense to learn from a variety of people, you know, depending on what your goals are. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, if you're going for that Hollywood look, I mean, the Vince Gironda methods, he really talks a lot about how your body looks. I mean, he really was not concerned so much about how strong you were at all. In fact, in his gym, if if somebody asked somebody else how much you lift. He'd yell at them and say, "We're not weightlifters. We're we're bodybuilders." And I mean, back then, you're you're talking about like bodybuilding today. You don't know who like the Olympia competitors and pro bodybuilders are. And I think there's a lot of other people in the same boat that just can't relate to these guys as much as they could some of these old school guys. If you go back and look at the pictures from like the 50s and the 60s and some of these guys, I mean, 
they're lean and they're they're sleek, they're ripped, and they're not like overly huge. But you look at the guys today, it's like almost like something you can't even fathom that you could ever look like that, even if you wanted to, and even if you could somehow look like that, is that something that like women would be attracted to? So I mean, there's definitely a lot of people that are interested in more of this Hollywood look, like you said. But I'd like to talk to you what training point of view. How do some of your techniques or approaches compare or contrast to some of the things you've read about Vince Gironda? Because you've got this book also, The Legend and Myth Book. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, great book, by the way. You know, I, I mean, you got an awesome job with it. Um, it took me a while to read. That's a lot of pages there, but, but incredible yeah. work. <laughs> you know, but uh, what I like about it, too, is I, I, I sat down and read part of it in one sitting, and then it took me three or four other sittings, but I could pick a little little bits out of the book, you know, like it's, it's not all strung together like a novel. It's nice just to right. choose different things. Um, well, Vince focuses a lot more on his specific exercises. He was really into specific exercises to target a certain part um, of the muscle. And, you know, some of his exercises are incredible. I used that 45 degree lat pull did like two weeks ago and it totally torched my lats and, and hit him exactly the way he said they would. Um, but what I focus on a lot more is specific rep ranges and rest periods, um, depending on what people are, are aiming for. So somebody wants uh, is, has enough muscle already, and they want to get you know more lean and defined. We would aim on some density training um, and st- more of a strength training, while avoiding excess fatigue, um, and then you know using a fat loss program. And somebody wants to gain muscle, we go more for the um, you know, sarcoplasmic training, you know, cumulative fatigue, higher rep type of training. So for me, I focus a lot more on the actual rep ranges and rest periods and let people choose their own favorite exercises. You know, like, you know, for instance, when I first started training, I had a training partner who was a lot shorter than, shorter than me, and he loved doing those barbell bench press or barbell um, military presses behind the neck. Right. If I tried to do that, it would just kill my rotator cuff. So for him, it was awesome. But for me, it was it was just a shoulder killer. Yeah. Um, you know, so I like people to be able to use the exercises that, that feel good to them because just depending on their, their uh, you know, how tall they are or how they are, their, you know, muscle insertion points and stuff, you know, people, are, things are going to feel different to somebody. All right. Could you explain sarcoplasm a little more? Yeah, yeah. What uh, sarcoplasm is is it's the intracellular fluid in a muscle cell. So, if you think of a muscle cell as, as a water, and you already know all this, but I'm just explaining this for your listeners. Um, so, if you think of a, of a muscle cell as a as a water balloon, um, to get to increase the size of a water balloon the quickest, you would fill it full of fluid. Now, this isn't like the same as like holding water. Like when people say they have water weight they're losing, this is it's still part of the muscle, but it's the the fluid within the muscle. Now, to increase that. Um, you train in the typically the eight to twelve rep range, and you and you do this in a way to fatigue the muscle. And this is what built. This is why bodybuilders train in eight to twelve rep ranges, and powerlifters train in a lower rep range. And I'll talk about lower rep ranges in a second here. Too. But um, so the goal of the workout um, to increase sarcoplasm is to do eight to twelve reps, but do it in a way to where each each set builds upon um, the previous set. So the sets become progressively harder um, within, you know, as you work out. So the way to do this is to have sort of a rhythmic tempo to the lifting and then also to keep the rest periods short. Okay. Um, it's, not, you know, it's not circuit training. You're still, you're still going to rest. You're, still, you're right. going to try to catch your breath a little bit. But, you know, you want to, you know, hit your next set before your muscle um, recuperates all the way. Um, and you aim for a decent amount of volume, you know, when you're when you're trying to increase um, sarcoplasmic, um, you know, get sarcoplasmic growth. And you know, think of like a perfect example. of This would be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like he totally did crazy amounts of volume. Uh, you know, did the higher rep range and all that sort of stuff. You don't have to go that extreme, but but that's what I tell people to think about when they think of sarcoplasmic growth. Okay. Now, this rest period that you're talking about is that is that the cumulative fatigue that you mentioned? Yeah, so um, the rest period, uh, so, you know, like, so you do set one and you just, you keep the rest period short, so then your following set um, is affected by that previous set, so you wouldn't be quite as strong as, as, so you you wouldn't be quite as strong as you normally would be, 
and then you would get and then your third set would be a little bit tougher like than your than your second set so um, yeah as the workout progresses the muscle fatigues more and more by the end your mus muscles should feel pretty toasted which is a lot different than strength strength training and density training yeah definitely now would you keep the same weight for each set or or do you have to keep dropping the weight as you add sets well the way you know the way i set it up um is you know i'll tell people to do maybe like the first exercise you use a pyramid a pyramid set because you have enough so you'll increase the weight a little bit and have you know you so you you your muscles won't be fatigued enough to where you have to use the same weight every time. So, like, let's say you're doing a bench, you do the typical 12, 10, 8, 6 type rep range. Rep range. You'd, you'd, your muscles would be, um, uh, well, I don't know, rested enough to be able to increase the weight and still hit those rep ranges. Now, on your second or third um, exercise that you chose, you're going to start to really start to feel cumulative fatigue. So, if you did bench press your first as your first exercise, um, you would do a pyramid scheme, and your, your second exercise was incline dumbbell press. Um, you would probably pick that same weight, and it would, you would naturally do less less reps each set, um, just because of the fatigue. Okay. Now, are there certain exercises you talked about the order you do them in? Are there some exercises that just aren't the best choices because the results they produce just aren't visually appear, appealing? Are you trying to go for more isolation type exercises, or what kind of exercises do you recommend um, people select if they're, you know, trying to get this this kind of training in? Yeah, now for for me, the only thing that I really stress is, you know, people do. Um, I think squats and deadlifts are fine for a period of time until some, you know, until people get the the size they're after. But then there's a certain point where it's like um, a certain point where where somebody doesn't need to do squats and deadlifts as much as they used to. Let's just put it that way. Right. Um, because what happens is, it, you know, the the upper thighs get really large, and then like the the you know the butt can get, you know, large and things like that, and it takes away from the from the the shoulder and and lat width a little bit. Um, now, somebody who's a bodybuilder or, or or like a performance athlete or something like that, obviously they're going to want to keep doing deadlifts and and uh, and squats and things like that. But if you're looking for like a true Hollywood look, um, I would tell people to kind of you know, just do that for a period of time, maybe just a certain part of the year, but not year round. Um, because what happens is that, that the squat and deadlift, they're, they're super effective. I mean, they put on a lot of muscle mass, but what typically happens is, 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 you know, the legs and hips and butt grow faster than the upper body. And, and since the person's not going to be going for that big of an upper body in the first place, it's going for density for the most part. Um, it kind of creates a, uh, you know, disproportionate body a little bit. Yeah, I could see that. And I mean, Jeronda said the same thing. He didn't believe in the back squats. I think he said it made the hips wider and things like that. But he had some variations of the exercise sometimes, like sissy squats or modified, different kinds of modified squats. Yeah, and, and for me, I stress a lot of explosive cardio and things like that. So, you know, I'm not against working the legs. I'm just we just work them in a different way a little bit. And, and you know, front squats, yeah, definitely, you know, are, are, are uh, better or for visual appeal than back squats. But but then again, you know, if somebody is um, like a performance athlete, like if I was going to play like rugby, for instance, I would squat and deadlift like crazy most likely because you kind of need that that type of strength. But that's yeah. not what my program is focusing on. We're more about visual visuals than we are about function. I, I think there are a lot of guys that, they lifted heavy. They got as big as they want to get. They have enough mass, but there are there are a lot of guys that just now want to get defined, but they don't want to add any more size at all. Like, what would you change, or what kind of rep ranges would they be doing? Now, at this point, you know, since the higher reps builds the muscle, and 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 going for fatigue, you know, is more likely to build the muscle. Um, you know, to me, the going for density and tone is actually when it becomes fun. Because then you're going for um, high tension lifting while you avoid fatigue, and and you know, you're you know you've been you have a powerlifting background stuff, so so you, so you get this. You know, each the sets don't each set doesn't build upon the previous set. What, what you're basically doing is each set is a separate entity. So right. the rest periods, yeah. So like the rest periods are longer. Right. Yeah. So you know, and I like to tell some of the younger guys like think of it like a video game when. You you know, use a special move, all your power bars all the way down. You have to wait for that power bar to get all the way back, back 
back up before you can do your special move again, right? Right. <laughs> um, so, so that I go for go for lower reps, heavier weight, um, and then avoiding fatigue. You know, and and like you, like I'm sure you've found, like when you're doing a bench press or something, sometimes the third or fourth or fifth set, you feel stronger than the first or second. You, yeah, you, know, you can, like, and you definitely don't want to do four reps at that point because then you're just for powerlifting, it's taxing your nervous system. Right. And how many, how many reps below failure? Like, when would you stop? A couple reps before? Like, what kind of weight would you choose? Yeah, like, typically I, I tell people to go in a three to five rep range and, and, and stop a couple reps short, just like you said. And, and people are, have a hard time doing that because they think that if they don't lift to, to failure, um, then they're not going to, you know, then their body has no reason to get stronger. But, it, but it's exactly so you're, you're getting positive feedback by avoiding failure and training failure gives your, gives your nervous system negative feedback. So, you know, muscle tone is, is, is more of a function of the nervous system. You know, it, it's, a, it's a partially contracted muscle in a relaxed state. So you, having an alert nervous system from lifting heavy is what causes, what causes the muscle to look toned. Um, you know, a lot of people think, well, why do I see all these guys lifting heavy weights and, and I don't see muscle tone? Well, well those people haven't, um, stripped away the, the body fat, you know, like, like right. if you took every power lifter out there and you took away all their body fat, they're going to have these, these crazy, incredible, dense muscles. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. There's a couple power lifters like that, but not the majority of them. <laughs> yeah, it's tougher, you know, and I think powerlifting too, I think it, it probably makes sense to have a little bit of, of, of body fat for leverage and stuff, you know, right. I, mean, I, I could totally yeah. see that. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so basically what about- I people lift heavier. Now, what about the people, everybody heard high reps for muscle tone. I mean, that feels like it's been pounded in everybody's head forever. What would you say to people that said that that's what they, they've always read, high reps? Yeah, that's a big, that is a pet peeve of mine, totally. And, and uh, it, it is kind of, it's just such a common question and stuff. I mean, not that you asked that, but, you know, it wasn't crazy that you asked that, but I'm just saying, like, I get asked that so often. Um, you know, here's the thing is people are, you know, mistaking cause and effect. So what high reps can burn a few more calories, right? So somebody that lives in a higher rep range, um, they're burning more calories during the workout, but here's the problem. And here's why bodybuilders lift in high reps. And and, uh, and why, let's say for a woman, friend, for instance, if she doesn't want to put on weight, she lifts high reps, but then her thighs are still big. Well, here's the deal. High reps cause a pump. So when anybody trains for the pump or trains for the burn, What's happening is blood is getting shuttled into the muscles. So the pump, what it does is it actually um, expands the, 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 you know, like the muscle area, but it also over time builds capillaries. So high reps, it, it increases sarcoplasm. We already discussed that. So it increases the fluid within the muscle cell, um, which will make a muscle bigger. But you know, going really high reps, it, go, it, it creates a pump. And then what happens is somebody builds big, veiny muscles over time. So if somebody wants big, veiny muscles, like, you know, bodybuilder, that makes sense. Well, high reps are great. A woman yeah. who wants to have slimmer legs for a swimsuit doesn't want to stick with high reps. You know, yeah, and, I mean, most women are going to think that they need to do high reps. They don't realize that they can actually get better results with, you know, less reps. Yeah, low reps and then training, you know, and the thing is, too, is, is – if somebody really doesn't want to add size whatsoever, so low reps can add size, and here's how. If somebody trains to failure or pushes failure on a regular basis, it's going to build the, you know, the, the myo, you know, myofibular growth, like the, the growth of the actual uh, contractile tissue. So to avoid that completely, what somebody, that, what somebody will want to do is do low reps but avoid failure. So pick a weight they can do eight times and do it you know, three to five times. Right. And, st- and still feel the tension. You know, you're going to use heavy weight to feel the tension, but just don't, just avoid the fatigue altogether, avoid the pump, and that's the way to avoid muscle growth. And the funny thing is, is, is the woman will be stronger and feel better and look better, you know, and, and that's why I tell people to avoid high reps, and, and it's so tough. And tell people to try it, they don't really get it. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense even for anyone that's in a weight class, too. I mean, you take a wrestler or somebody, they... If you add too much muscle, you're in the next weight class, but they do want to actually be stronger. So, I mean, it does have a little bit of a performance uh, viewpoint as well. Yeah, I, I felt out a couple of boxers that were trying to drop weight class, and, I, and uh, 
if they did a lot of, I had them do a lot of road work, you know, a lot of running and stuff, and then they do exactly what I just described there, is get stronger, but don't fatigue the muscle. And it, it, it worked, worked for them. And the neat thing was, is it, you know, increased, the, increased their punching strength and stuff too. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a win-win. Yeah, speaking of uh, road work, you know, you're somebody who actually does push cardio when so many other people are bashing, you know, steady state or different kinds of regular cardio. I mean, what's your, what's your take on cardio and the best kind to use? Well, the thing about the the cardio bashing is it comes from from a from a good, from a decent thought. Like like here's the deal. So, um, cardio is like just steady state cardio. It's not the most time efficient thing in the world. So it, it you know there's a time element involved that takes longer than doing like a circuit training or metabolic resistance training. You know that type of thing. Um, but there's a place for it. So. What I see in lots of gyms is what I call, um, what I like to call uh, slightly chubby people, people who are 80% of the way to their goals. Most of the gyms I go to, there's a lot of people who are, they're, they're fit and they look good. It's just like they just need to lose that last 10 pounds. Yeah. And, you know, where it comes from lots of the times is, you know, a little bit of diet and stuff, obviously, but um, people are so stubborn about being anti-cardio that, that they're kind of, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, they can definitely benefit by just adding in an extra 30, 40, you know, you know up to maybe half hour to an hour with the cardio each, each week, and that would help them lose that last little bit of stubborn body fat. You know, because what happens is, is you can only diet so hard, right, before you don't have enough nutrients. You can only do metabolic resistance training or surf training so many times a week before you get overtrained. The one variable that you can increase almost indefinitely is low intensity cardio. Now, I don't recommend people like do eight, 10, nine hours of, of cardio a week, um, but you can do that if you had to. I, I interviewed uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, personal trainer, Cornell Chen, and Leonardo had to lose uh, what was it, 17 pounds in two weeks of body fat. Wow. He had Leonardo, he had, he had, uh, Leo and the entire cast do uh, four hours of training a day. Three of three of it was cardio. Three hours per day of cardio. So they did. What, what kind of cardio they did, were they doing? There was just kind of a low intensity. Like I think they were doing beach, beach aerobics or something like that. It was kind of they were in um, in Thailand. Um, okay. You know, so nothing nothing too crazy, right? They did very low intensity type of cardio. But you know, he but Leo lost all that weight. He lost 17 pounds in two weeks. So they did about eight or nine weeks worth of cardio, and and they did it in two weeks. So, so would cardio. You, would you, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. So yeah. So cardio can be increased like mad, and even like a lot of the bodybuilder guys. I mean, the last bodybuilder I, I followed was back in the early 90s was Dorian Yates, and I remember he would walk. Uh, you know, he did crazy amounts of steroids and stuff too. Let's not hit ourselves, but he would walk. Um, like something like two hours per day, like two months leading up to Mr. Olympia. Um, you know, and, and I, and I don't recommend people do it just low intensity cardio like that. I have a more strategic way of setting up cardio, but, but you know, it, it works bottom line. Well, you're not, you're not suggesting people do one to two hours a, a day of cardio, are you? No, not at all. You know, and, and the thing is if somebody, if somebody does CrossFit or, or something like that, where they're already getting their, um, you know, heart rate jacked up and they're getting a cardio effect, then they probably only need to add, uh, you know, 20, you know, 15, 20 minutes of, of steady state cardio right after they get done um, working out. What happens with, what happens is when somebody does like a circuit training or interval, interval training or something like that, um, the body releases the free fatty acids into the bloodstream. If those free fatty acids aren't used, they get redeposited back into the fat cells. So, so slow cardio um, it is good at using fat for energy. It's bad at releasing the body fat from the fat cells, though. So, um, you know, that, that's the cool thing about circuit training or when someone's training intensely with weights or that sort of thing is they've already, you know, they have a window of opportunity of burning body fat with cardio they normally wouldn't get. And that's why most cardio is a waste of time because people just do slow and steady off the bat. Now, I like to separate the lifting from the cardio part. So since my lifting is not like cardio intense, you know, like most of the stuff I recommend is not going to get people out of breath. It's not, not circuit training. Right. Um, I recommend somebody do 15 to 20 minutes of high intensity interval, interval training, which is 
basically like doing circuit training on a piece of cardio equipment. Uh, okay, could you just explain that a little more, what that look like? Yeah, exactly. So if you if you ever go to the gym and you see somebody on a treadmill and they're and they're sprinting for like 30 seconds and walking for a minute and sprinting for 30 seconds and walking for a minute, um, that's kind of what I'm describing. And it can be done on an elliptical or a treadmill or, a, or you know, even like a spinning class is kind of like that. Mine's a little bit, you know, more controlled. It's only for 15 minutes, not like a real long workout like that. But But again... That intense exercise, um, that uh, you know, metabolic training, releases the free fatty acids from the fat cells. So, that, so that's the, the the important part of that. The steady state stuff is is what's going to use that though, so it doesn't get redeposited. And that's why if people added 15 to 20 minutes of steady state cardio after the circuit training, if they're doing like Adam Steer's program or kettlebell bell workout or church training or any of those that are kind of a little bit more circuit in nature. Um, you know, they should add in a, at least a couple times a week of steady state um, cardio to burn those to burn those free fatty acids up. If they're okay, doing so more if like, you're, if you're doing sorry. say, if you're saying you're doing like your routine, you do 15 minutes of the high intensity interval training plus 15 minutes of steady state cardio. But if you're doing more of a metabolic resistance type workout where you're getting cardio while doing the weights, then you would say just add 15 minutes of steady state afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Did I get that right. Okay. Yeah, because my the the high intensity interval training would you know people who are doing the circuit training they already have done that in in, in their lifting session. You know, I okay. I do like to separate lifting from the from cardio, but both ways work. Cool. Is there any downside? I guess just time, right? Time yeah, that's the only downside. You know, is, is that uh, there is time, but you know, but the thing is, is that I mean, to be honest. You know, most people in, in the world, the United States or wherever, you know, it, it's not the worst thing in the world to get more exercise. I mean, if anything, we need more movement and exercise than what we're getting. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting down all day at a desk typing away for, right. for, for my career, so I don't mind the extra 15, 20 minutes a day. It, it, you know, I think it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, too much uh, sitting at the desk, sitting in the car, sitting on the couch, moving around <laughs> for, an, for an extra half hour a day can't be can't be the worst thing in the world. No, people will get in incredible shape too, and then they'll be hooked. <laughs> so. Cool. Yeah, I, I think we've I've done things like the high intensity interval training before in college. We had uh, fart leg running. I don't know if there's another word for it too, but we did it on the tracks where it might not be the same time intervals, but we'd sprint the straightaways on the track and then walk you know, walk the corners and do that oh, a few tough. times. Do that. Yeah, it's tough, but I mean, it feels, it feels great. Yeah, for sure. So you don't have to just do this on a treadmill. I mean, you can do it outdoors too. Oh yeah, for sure. You can do it. Exactly. The main thing is, is that, you know, any, any of that circuit training stuff, you know, works for the post-exercise oxygen consumption and, 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 you know, HGH release and the releases of free fatty acids. It's just that, just adding just a little bit of cardio, though, and that, that's what will help people get those last five or ten pounds off and go from the two-pack to a four-pack or four-pack to a six-pack, that type of thing. So, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, most of the competitive bodybuilders that I've personally met or uh, trained with at different gyms, they didn't do a lot of a lot of crazy cardio. They did a lot of steady-state cardio. You'd see guys just walking on inclines and things like that for like an hour after their weight training. You know, a lot of actors and actresses in Hollywood do that too. You know, but but the difference between those people and then us is that that's that's their entire job, so they can spend all day training and stuff. But uh, right. but but the bottom line is it's effective. You know, there, there's definitely a time element involved, but it works. It's just how much time people want to put in. Yeah, for sure, man. So how, how would someone use Vince Gironda's techniques? Some of the things he teaches. How can they use those with yours? Uh, mainly on just just the awesome exercises that he recommends and stuff. I mean, I, I, I'm just kind of experimenting around with some of them and, and having a blast. Um, you know, for example, like let's say somebody wanted to get bigger a bigger upper chest. That's a common thing for guys because lots of times guys get a droopy chest because they, they just have lower pecs that are that are you know built in and their upper pecs aren't filled in. Well, they could choose uh, you know the press to the neck that. Um, Vince, that Vince uh, recommends, and then you know use like my, the phase one of my lifting program, which focuses on you know sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So basically doing the eight to twelve reps and making sure that each set of those 
gets gets harder, you know, by not resting too much, not resting too much in between reps either, kind of making it rhythmic. Um, so using his exercise with my set and reps rep scheme would, would would do extremely well. Okay, that's a that's a good uh, recap. Let's kind of point out then after they've gotten the size that they want, they're big enough. Then what comes next? Because you mentioned this earlier in the interview. Then what do they do? Yeah. Then what they would do is uh, go for the lower rep ranges, so they could. You know, the thing the thing about the press to the neck, um, the, I I just get a little bit. I, I I like to warn people just it's it's kind of a scary one if you're going heavy. So maybe at this point, you know, if you're going to go lower rep a little bit heavier, maybe more just of a basic bench press at that point. All right, that one puts too much stress in your shoulders if you're using heavy weight. Yeah, I mean you know that. I mean you kind of want to keep the elbows tucked in if you're using heavier weight and stuff, and and and. and and by that point, if they already have size in their upper pecs, the you know the lower rep the lower reps are going to maintain that size. They're not going to lose the size. They just won't gain any more. So yeah, I would recommend um, three to five reps, stopping you know two to th- like two reps short of failure with a decent amount of rest in between each set of like bench press, for instance, if that was their goal. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm gonna have to try this as well. How important is nutrition overall, do you think? Do you cover that in your uh, programming as well? You know, what's funny is is I went from a, from a point of being nutri- not knowing a whole lot about nutrition and just eating basic when I first started lifting, and then I got really, really into all the intricacies of, like, carb timing and all this different type of stuff, and uh, okay. after, after uh, you know, Becoming friends with Brad Pilon and and uh, and John Barban, <laughs> those guys. Um, now I'm just a, mainly a calories in, calories out guy, and I fully believe that that's that what that's what works. If someone wants to eat two to three meals a day and get their the nutrients they want each day, that's cool. If somebody wants to do it six times a week or six times a day, that's cool too. I've, I've seen too many examples of people who've eaten just a couple times a day look great, or people who've eaten eight times a day and they look great. I just think it's more of a calories thing. And I do cover that, you know, what calories to aim for for each goal that someone's after. Okay. Um, so it is, like, is there like, different like, kinds of food you're eating or do you just add up the calories? You know, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of protein somebody has to get and, and, and things like that and little tips um, okay. you know, about how to, you know, sometimes to cut back a little bit on carbs at nighttime um, helps. But then, but then again, I've seen people who can eat carbs at night and get ripped too. So, Mainly to me, it's, it's it's more about getting the right amount of protein, you know, just to, without going crazy, um, and then not going too high in the calories. So I actually believe that, you know, building lean muscle is more of a function of exercise than it is of eating. Okay. A little bit, and I know some people don't share that view, but uh, but you know, I mean, if somebody wants to put on overall like size, like football, players, of course they're going to eat want to eat more. But if somebody wants to put on just lean and every, every ounce of muscle that they put on is without fat, then it's more of a training thing. Okay, now where can people learn more about about your program and your philosophy and kind of get all this mapped out in more detail if they want to uh, kind of combine some of what they learned in the Vince book and use that with some of your laid out programs? Because Vince, I mean, the book, it, it gives tons of tips. There's lots of workouts, but there's not exactly like a week-by-week plan to follow. Yeah, you know, I, I have a couple places, but let me just uh, just direct people to my to my blog because it'll have uh, you know links to everything that I that I do. I'm um, just fitnessblackbook.com, and then um, once they get to my site, um, up in the very um, top underneath the banner, there's a free report they can get um, if they want to just get a sample of my stuff. It's called Abs Blueprint, but there'll be a link that says free report, um, and if they want to go directly and check out. Uh, my muscle building pro- uh, program for men and, and the, the you know workout program for women, um, then they'll see little ebook covers on the side. I, but I don't want to you know sell people hard or anything like that. I'm just trying to give good content. So if they want to basically just learn more about my methods and stuff, there's tons of free resources on the blog. And if they like it, um, you know, you should definitely check out the paid products. It's just a little bit more in detail. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for your time, Russ. I really appreciate it. Was there anything else you wanted to uh, cover? Anything we left out? No, you know, I think we covered it really well. And then again, what an awesome book. I mean, you guys definitely took uh, the, the and everything that that guy's written and put it into one place. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Alan Palmieri is the author. So yeah, he did a tremendous job putting this all together. So special thanks to Alan for writing the book. It's one of my all-time favorites. And uh, I thought you'd uh, 
get a kick out of it too, Rusty. So I'm glad you liked it. Again, thanks for your time. And I think we learned a lot on this interview. I'm looking forward to trying some of these things out myself. Thanks, Mike. All right. We'll talk to you real soon. Bye. All right. Have a good one.